You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of RX Radio. Uh, special one for you today. This is actually uh, his good friend of mine, Kevin. Uh, runs a runs a facility out of Long Island called Ronan Athletic. Um, so Kevin's been a friend of mine for some time. He's actually running through our PSL one program. He's almost like auditing for me just to, you know, make sure when the rubber hits the road with all this stuff, um, we're still kind of keeping on top of best practices. So, you know, as I said, Kevin owns a facility out of New York. Um, you know, he's a he's a true athlete in the sense that he. You know, he's a little bit versatile in the way he competes. Just came off a powerlifting meet, does OCR or has done OCR or obstacle course racing, um, you know, and ha- just casually has a uh, second degree black belt in Japanese jiu-jitsu, which is pretty cool to watch if you haven't seen it. Definitely see it. I might, I'll throw up a link actually in the show notes of him just kind of going through some of the Japanese jiu-jitsu stuff. Um, but the big folks today's episode is conditioning and the difference between cardio and conditioning. Uh, we talk a little bit about kind of the boots on the ground experience in New York right now. Um, so the facility Ronan is, is relatively new and then, you know, how Kevin's kind of managing his facility in like these crazy ass times. Um, but yeah, I think Kevin's big win is, you know, the understanding of, uh, conditioning versus cardio. So, you know, he put together actually a conditioning program for me that I was like, dude, you got to do something with us. Um, cause obviously we're coming out of, hopefully coming out of, um, quarantine or lockdown soon you know conditioning is something that takes minimal tools minimal skills uh, i don't want to say minimal skills but minimal tools to be able to improve upon so if i had this time to like you know i can't really start lifting on heavy barbells right now conditioning is something that i've been focusing on um so really going through the difference between cardio and conditioning while also seeing those way the way his mind works on the programming for conditioning so it was nice enough to kind of extend us an offer at rx radio um for a conditioning program that he's been nice enough to share with me. And uh, so if you're interested, and I would say definitely check it out, it's a good thing to have in your back pocket, uh, especially if you're dealing with, you know, group settings or even group settings or even online, having like a go-to like good conditioning platform to start is always uh, is always beneficial. So um, if you guys go to ronanathletic.com slash shop, shop uh, use code RX30, RXD30, um, it's a good little program to have. Uh, and you, we can kind of, you see the moving parts of it as we talk about the dishing, the difference between core and conditioning uh that being said uh moving forward into the end of this month we have some big things coming on the rx radio prescript side of things um so we're rolling out a new rolling out a new product um that i think fills a much needed gap in a lot of pe- the way people program a lot of way they work out um so we're not going to give too much details away all i'm going to say is if you want to be the first to know head over to uh, www.pre-script.com there should be a little pop-up that comes when the website sign or when you, you get to the website uh throw your name email in there if you're not on there already and you guys are going to be the first to know we'll give a little bit more details as to what it is um is coming it's going to release uh, in a few weeks. So it's going to be up uh, on the website and in our app on, uh, I want to say the 20th, the Wednesday. Uh, so if you guys want to be the first to know, we will be going out to the email list first. So head on over to www.predescript.com for that. Um, but in the meantime, make sure you head over to Ronan Athletic, go to the show notes. We'll have the, we'll have the promo code for that conditioning program ready for you. Um, and hope you guys enjoy the episode and we'll see you guys next week. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, you know, I've been reading article after article about 24-hour fitness, LA Fitness, Gold's Gym, like 24 hours lining up for bankruptcy. Yeah, I saw that too. And all I can think about is, man, I could get so much. Like, where are they going to liquidate that equipment to? Like, (laughs) where do I need to go with a checkbook that I could pick up some hammer strength for keeping machines on foreclosure or something like that? But it's like, how do you think it's going to change, right? Like, I mean, right now in Australia, like, having a squat stands like having the only lighter in a crack house like if anyone has like a home kit like you're the dude people are running like speakeasy training sessions how do you think coming out the other end of this like you know whatever how do you anticipate a new normal like people are sinking a bunch of money into like you, you know trainers to train them from home and like all this new equipment like what do you how do you see this changing like your day-to-day if at all and then like globally from like an industry perspective 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely already see it a lot where like, people are investing in home gym equipment. Like, I think that's going to definitely become a new normal. People are going to be trying to do more stuff outside. But I think at the end of the day, like the community inside the gyms is like really valuable. I think that's where like a lot of our success is based. It's like, you know, how motivated is someone really to go into their basement every day and lift weights? Like they'll do it for a little bit, but like people like to come here because they like seeing friendly faces and bullshitting with people and having that community of pushing each other. And, you know, that's on the group member side and on the one-on-one training side, I think the in-person coaching over online coaching, like I'm doing some online coaching now and it's never been my thing. I always feel like I can get so much more done in person if I could touch somebody and show somebody than like watching on the video and like trying to go back and forth. It's, it's a mess, but I'm making the best of it now. I think we're going to eventually get back to that. And I think like smaller gyms like mine, I think small personal training studios is going to be the way to go because you could keep it to a one-on-one basis, clean everything. I think it's the larger gyms that are going to have more of an issue. It's just about what they're going to allow you to do and what people are going to be comfortable doing. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's funny, like the projections that you hear, like this is the first time that people have been working out of their homes ever. It's like, dude, my house is fucking littered with exercise equipment. Mike and Louise Shallow were using that shit. I'm pretty sure there's some sort of bike rower apparatus that my mom hangs clothes on. Like, I'm pretty sure still to this day, it's still there. It's like my dad's like, oh, fuck, we'll just throw it up. I was like, no, like, it's all right. I can hang like 25 dresses on this thing. It's like people are looking at this. Like, and, and trying to anticipate a new normal and it's like look there's nothing to say like, if people bought this now it doesn't mean they're not going to return back to their gym right, right? Like, for me to like you know we're training out of like a closed crossfit box in brookvale which is like 40 minutes away and on days i don't want to train this might sound fucked up i like going to gyms where there's other people because it's like i don't want to look like a punk in front of other people it's like if i have like I'm training at my buddy's house and his like cat is like walking across the basement or there's a fridge like five minutes or like five seconds away and I can just grab food. It's like, those aren't good workouts. Like no. there's a lot to be said about like environment and building habits. I have, I mean, I've had a, a gym in my garage and it's fully equipped. You know, I have a squat rack. I got a lamb on, I have a whole dumbbell rack, kettlebells, everything like that. And I can never focus at home. I like, even though it's in the garage and I shut the door, I'm always distracted. And now I feel that same way here at my gym. You know, I come here, especially now when it's empty and no one's around. Like, I'm just like kind of dicking around. I'm like freaking on the phone, which is like a disease. I'm distracted by this. Like, but yeah, when there's people around and they're like, oh, how much weight are you putting on that bar? It's like, yeah, I'm going to put 10 more pounds on the bar. Like, and I'm going to keep going. You need that little push and you get some energy off of people. And I think you can get some good workouts on your own, but at the end of the day, it's just not going to be enough. I think it might be the new norm in the terms of, you know, two days a week, I'm going to work at home, but I'm going to try to make my appointment at the gym the other two days a week and get a workout there. Um, you know, and the big, like I said, you know, the larger group gyms are going to be hard. People are going to be scared to go. But I think if you can make an appointment based, either small group classes or one-on-one training, at least for like the next year or so until we kind of figure all this out. I mean, everything's changing minute to minute. I feel like you wake up one day and they got different news than the next day. So, um, you know, just getting back to some kind of good routine. It's hard. What you were saying too, I wanted to make a point, dusting stuff off. I have clients who like, I'm like, they're quarantined at home at like their parents' house. I'm like, they're like, we have some equipment here. I'm like, text me over like pictures, show me what you got. So like they're getting like the old school bench, you know what I mean? Like the, the one inch plates and stuff like that. And they're like, send me all these pictures. I'm writing them programs. I'm like, all right, this is what you got. This is going to be your workouts. And we're doing zoom conferences, but even for them, they can't wait to get back to the gym. I mean, it's good for now, but they want to get back here with everybody else, you know? Yeah, I feel like the people who like working out by themselves have been working out by themselves yeah. for a long time. Like the 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 garage hero gym guy who's got like the reverse hyper and like the mono lift, he's got it. Like no one's going to be like, if you didn't do it before, this isn't going to automatically like change. If you liked going to the gym, you're not going to enjoy working out at home. Like you right. can lie to yourself and try to make, oh, I'm loving this. This is great. Like, I can just play whatever music I want. So, again, put your headphones in. I know you're lying to me. Like, stop, stop. You just sound silly right now. It's, did you, I mean, from a business perspective, because, like, I, I kind of want to dig in a little bit about, like, Ronan and, and, like, how, like, how you got started in, like, 
coaching and to the point where like, Oh, I'm going to, I know, like, I know a great business model. I'm going to own a gym. I don't, like, know. Fuck. I don't <laughs> think I ever said those words. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. But it's like, did you ever contingency plan from like, like how long, how long have you been at the helm of Ronin for? Uh, almost a year. I'd say we, I rented this building in March 15th of 2019. So I'm, I, I made it a year and a day until I got fucking shut down. <laughs> that's not bad they say most businesses fail in five years anyways yours just got screwed by a virus yeah basically i mean and it was amazing because i really saw like an uptick over the past few months of just like memberships and class attendance and stuff like that like i'm like oh we're really turning the corner here you know i'm coming into this like almost a year and it's just like bam fuck you (laughs) like oh but you know we'll come back around so i think i told you last time we spoke i'm I'll be 37 this year. So it's kind of been a long, crazy path to opening a gym. I don't think if you told me five years ago, this was going to be what I was doing, I would have believed you. Um, So if we take it kind of all the way back, um, I've always been into working out, fitness, kind of started in like high school, like hitting the weight room after school with my buddies, bench pressing like five days a week and hitting the squat rack for curls. I mean, I don't think... I even knew what a squat rack was for back then. I mean, maybe I did some leg extensions for a lower body, but it was all upper body. Um, and then I found myself, I was doing construction. I always worked construction from when I was like a teenager, like summers after school, I would do some construction. And I got into martial arts with my dad at like 18 and we trained martial arts for like over 12 years, um, like seven days a week. We had like a dojo in my dad's basement. We were just all out. I've, trained in like eight different martial arts. I have a second degree black belt in jujitsu. I trained judo. Um, So I kind of got into teaching and coaching through martial arts. Like I found a passion there where I was teaching a bunch of classes at different schools. I would do some one-on-ones and stuff like that. So I kind of got my coaching experience there. Um, We'll fast forward to about like around I was 29 and my wife was pregnant um, we had our first kids. So this was a, a little over seven years ago and just things changed in my life. And it was just hard to make like a class anymore, you know, cause it was six o'clock at night and that was like dinner time or like I was working a second job and like I found my free time to kind of do my workouts was like midday and no one was offering martial arts classes. I couldn't get anyone to train with me. So I'm like, I'm going to really dig back into this gym stuff. I mean, I always kind of kept myself in shape, but I'm like, I'm going to focus on this now. So I started going, this was around the time I crossed, it was kind of getting popular. So I'm like, I never really got into like squatting and deadlifting. So we're at about like a little, like I said, a little over seven years ago. And when I do something, I'm all in on it. So, you know, I'm reading every book, I'm listening to podcasts because it's kind of like when podcasts started coming around and just like really dive into like what I should be doing, what's the right idea, programming, um, and kind of just progressed from there to where I had got the gym in my house and people started asking me, like, obviously I was kind of in shape and people were like, what are you doing? Do you think you could help me out? So I started having some people over my house. I'd train them in my garage. Um, and then I was going to a gym that was up the block. They knew that I had coaching experience from martial arts. They wanted me to teach some classes. Uh, they had like a kickboxing class. Like we need you to cover this. Maybe you could do some personal training. You seem to be knowledgeable. Um, so I started kind of working there and in my house and that transitioned to me working there and then eventually getting, you know, a good amount of clients there and a client load and realizing that I've always had the mentality, like I never want to work for someone else. If I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it on my own type thing. So uh, that translated into me saying like they were expanding and they wanted me to invest in the gym and we couldn't really work out the deal we wanted to. I was talking to my accountants and my lawyers and they're like, you have this money and you think this is what you want to do you shouldn't be investing with them just open your own place and that kind of fast forwards us right to me saying screw it i rented a building and just went for it i love how the story includes and but isn't centered around the fact that you're a like wait that you're a two second like second degree black belt in bjj uh, so Japanese jiu-jitsu, it's a little different. So like all of your main martial arts, like Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, judo, Aikido are all based to have like Japanese jiu-jitsu. So it's a yeah. little bit different. Um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is almost just like kind of like the groundwork in Japanese jiu-jitsu. Are you familiar with like judo? You ever watched that in like the yeah, yeah, I have one of my Yeah, one of my friends was like went to the Olympics for Canada in judo. Yeah, so Japanese jiu-jitsu is almost like 
a little bit more of like a street version of judo. I trained in judo simultaneously because that's more of like a sport compared to like what we would call more like a street art and stuff like that. Like I hate, I hate people talking because they're like, like, oh, sh- street martial arts, like, you know, all the BJJ guys think like that's bullshit. But like there are rules in BJJ and like, you don't want to, I've been in a situation where I got tackled by a guy who was about double my size and I gouge his eyes out to get him off of me and that's just not legal in the cage so i mean there's my point right there <laughs> and that's something that you'd learn in japanese jiu-jitsu yeah it's funny because i was like i was only training for about two years so i was like a green belt at the time and we were out so i was like 20 years old and uh we were like bouncing for my buddy's little, little brother's house party and there was like a fight broke out so i so i thought like i'm gonna dive right in and say hey you five assholes you're out of here and they basically said, fuck you. And one guy threw a punch. I kind of, I dodged out of the punch. I thought I was doing good. And some other guy just tackled me from the side. And as I was getting kicked in the face by like four other people, I remembered from what my instructor told me, like gouge the eyes, almost like rake the eyes. So kind of like drag my fingertips across his face like five times. And this guy was gone. Like, I don't even know where he went. <laughs> so I'm like, that see, the that's the exception behind Rodin. Like, I mean, those yeah. are probably unfamiliar with the name, right? Because like that, when I saw that, I was like, all right, I definitely, like, I definitely fuck with this guy. Because like Rodin is kind of like, I mean, you could probably define it better than I can, but I had some familiarity just with like having some East Asian studies background and from a historical perspective. But is that, that's kind of where you got it from? Like define that for people. Yeah. So Rodin would be like a, a masterless samurai. So samurais, uh, basically the word i know in the last samurai i think if you ever watched that movie they kind of highlight this but like t- samurai means kind of to serve so they always served like a master but um if that master let's say died or they left they were supposed to actually commit suicide by like sticking the knife in their stomach and killing themselves but if they didn't and they kind of went like rogue they would be considered a ronin so it would be like a master a samurai a rogue samurai so the kind of conception of the gym you know, at the time when I started this gym, I had a CrossFit level one cert and a few other certifications, but I felt like I needed to kind of go my own path. So I felt like Ronin was an appropriate title for the name of the gym. And is that something like, is that something that you kind of carry with you, like in the, in how you operate like the gym, like you talk a lot about the community aspect of it. We, we've talked a lot like offside, of, like outside of the podcast, but like, is that, is that something that helps like guide a lot of the decision-making? Yeah. I mean, I think that I didn't like the whole CrossFit thing. I didn't feel like it would be right to kind of use that name, even though I could affiliate with them. I felt like, you know, as soon as I went, I got dragged to a PS, uh, not a PS, uh, CrossFit level one cert. And, you know, as soon as like, we got into the programming, it was like our idea of programming is putting a bunch of exercises into a hopper because they call it the hopper method, spinning it and picking like three out. I'm like, yeah, real intelligent programming. <laughs> like there's a, literally no thought behind it. So I didn't want to follow that, that line. I feel like a lot of people are also like scarred. Like I get a lot of people coming out of CrossFit who are looking for something similar, but not CrossFit. And I felt like that was just a better path to take. And it aligned itself better with like how I feel. I mean, I run group classes are like 20% or 30% of like my revenue. But I think it's an important part because it does create that community. So a lot of my one-on-one clients and stuff like that also take the group classes and they're able to like interact with each other. But I treat my group classes like a personal training session. Like we're going to do sets. So we're going to, and you know, so if we have two people working on one station, we're going to have a barbell and some dumbbells and we're going to do maybe some overhead presses with the barbell while the other per- person is doing like a Bulgarian split squat. And we're going to do that for reps and then we're going to switch and we're going to do sets and then we're going to the next thing. And then we're going to do some conditioning. It's going to be a little bit more intelligent, similar to like some of the stuff I sent you where like, we're not doing snatches under fatigue with a barbell overhead and we're not doing plyometrics on a box when we're like, when we can't even stand anymore, but we are going to like push some sleds, maybe flip some tires. Um, I'm not a huge burpee guy, but I don't have anything against them if they're, you know, programmed somewhat intelligently, but we'll use some more body weight stuff to kind of get that fatigue. I mean, you don't need a barbell over your head on, in those situations to really elicit the kind of response we want. I don't understand why they need to do it all the time. Well, that's one thing, man, like that I, I always admire when, when people take on owning a facility is like, I mean, I have to overcome objections of some things I talk about, but it's like, it's in my DMs. Like, it's not like it's, it really affects my life, 
because everyone, like, people will message me like, hey, what's your opinion on this? Like, what's your opinion on CrossFit? Or what's your companion, opinion on like mace swings or kettlebell tricks and all this stuff? And like, I could be totally honest and blunt with them because like, you know, these people are just donning my Instagram account and not necessarily like keeping my lights on. Like, how do you, how do you get, I don't know, maybe buy-in or like, how do you offset like the influx? Because I'm sure like people who go to your gym, like your members, they digest content the same way we do, right? Like they see something on social media and they come to you. How do you, how do you skirt that conversation around like popular trends in training to keep them on that more intelligent track? So I don't think that some of the things that you mentioned, even cross it, like, don't get me wrong. We'll, I'll run once in a while. You'll have, we'll have a workout that looks similar to what you would see in a cross it, but it's just not every day. And it's programmed differently in the ways that I don't recommend weights for people. And I don't recommend like that they necessarily like go fast for time. So, so like, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily not doing those movements. We're just kind of taking a different approach. And even with the stuff, like you're saying, like kettlebell tricks, like people are like, Oh, I saw some guy spinning a kettlebell like five times and catching again. Like all that has its place. I think the problem is people get too dogmatic about it. You know what I mean? Like this is like, look at me, I'm ripped and I flip kettlebells over my head. I'm like, you, you definitely do a lot more than flip kettlebells over your head and you're just not telling people that. So like I have mace spells here. Obviously we have kettlebells, but we use them in different ways. But I think all that is good, fun, maybe like an off day, you want to have some fun and flip some kettlebells. You want to swing a mace spell around and mess around with this or that. But like when it comes down to your real training days, you know, we need to work on mobility, stability, and strength, right? <laughs> Three main points. So I mean, we want to get you stronger. We want to get you moving better. And then when it comes to the other stuff, like I said, just don't be dogmatic about it. I try to explain to them, like, we're going to intelligently program. And if you want to mess around with the kettlebells, go flip the kettlebells. Make sure you put a mat underneath them so you don't break anything. Now, like, it's one thing to have that conversation with members. Like, I'm assuming most people, like, they, when they sign up, there's an inherent level of trust in you. But how do you start to have this conversation? Because you have, you have coaches that work with you. Yeah. How, how do you start to weed out that? Because, like, man, as we know, like, the term coach is, you know, we, we kind of let slip for a while what it meant to be a coach. And, like, there's people who sort of snuck in under the radar that it's like, oh, no, like, this person has the same job title as me. I think there's a lot of people that sneak in under the radar. I, <laughs> it's been a year, for, obviously, that I've been in, like, a, a bigger gym where I see other coaches working. So, you know what I mean? Like, here, I, I have – I'd say three coaches that are basically like on payroll for me. And then I have two other coaches who come in and rent space for me to train their clients. So basically their clients pay them and then they just pay me to use the space. So when it comes to that, as long as those people are kind of just abiding by the rules and not gaining in our way, I don't really care what they do. Like, I mean, I might not approve of what they're doing, but they're paying me and they don't have any affiliation with me. Um, when it comes to my people, I try to find coaches who are on the same. I mean, like, you know, Eric, and I think you've met Jen. So those are like two of my main coaches. We're all on the same wave, wavelength. I try to have like a monthly Saturday meeting where we talk about just like programming exercises, how we want certain things done in the group classes, how we do our programming. Like when I bring people in now, like my schedule is full, right? Well, it was full up until like a month ago. <laughs> so but I do most of the sales because sales is a big part of personal training and people can't seem to get that. You know what I mean? And I rather have really intelligent trainers because I see trainers who are good salesmen and trainers who are good coaches, but not always both. And that's, that's an issue. So like I rather have the good coaches and I bring the people in. I do the face to face assessments with them, take them through movements, see what they want, try to sell them on what's best for them. Is it a group membership? Is it personal training? Is it somewhere a combination of the two? Are we going to write some programs for this person? Um, once I get them in, I find them. I pick one of my coaches who I think will fit their either schedule or their personality. And a lot of times what we do is we'll talk together on, you know, what a program is going to look like for this person. And we kind of keep it in a drawer. And that person necessarily always is in training. So, like, let's say Eric can't train someone at this time, but they want to train. I'll take it. I grab their program right out of the drawer and we're kind of hitting the road running. So we're all on the same page with almost everyone's program in the gym. Yeah. That's gotta be tough, man. Like, you know, there's some days where you just, you know, there's that old adage. If you want something done, do it yourself. 
but that that collective mindset i think kind of brings everyone to the table which is hard like i mean god knows how many egos there are in kind of what we do in the industry we're in yeah. so people kind of like you have that scarcity mentality they don't want other people touching their people it's like look man like we're all going to come at this we're all going to come at this together with your population like what do you find like what do you find pro like you have to program for the most like people come in and like everyone probably says the same shit right and it pretty much boils down to like look i want to look better naked which is like the like a big crux of programming what do you find almost like prioritizing with your like with your member base ab- above all else if there is one thing so see we might differ on this but i think we got to get them moving big movements like compound movements, moving some weight, building some strength and some muscle. And I think that like, I always go back to your adage about the vegetables and the tomato sauce type thing. Like I can't, a lot of these people like middle, let's say like gen pop, maybe 30 to 4 year old women, sometimes men, but just like, like you said, like want to look better naked and don't give two shits about their fucking shoulder or hip mobility and can't connect the dots that, that in the long run is going to help them move better, stay healthier and eventually be able to do that. But if I'm sitting there, you know, doing a lot of mobility and stability work with someone, which they really need, they're literally, I could have the same conversation. I swear to fucking God with, with the same person, like every Tuesday, like as they're doing this, like, how is this helping me burn calories? I'm just like, Oh fuck. So <laughs> like, you need to get that by and they need to get sweating and stuff like that. Even though I know that's not what they need right now in their mind, they need that. And I think that's like the biggest hurdle is kind of combining the two, like keeping them feeling good, staying healthy so they could get back to the gym. But also like, just like I said, like those bigger compound movements, helping them like it's body competition. I hate scales. Like I'm going to go into this rant about scales. Like people come in and they're like, wait, wait, wait. I'm like, you don't walk around with a number on your forehead saying how much you weigh. Nobody gives a shit how much you weigh. If your pants fit good, if you have a, like you want to be lean, there's a likelihood that you might weigh actually a couple more pounds than you do now. If your body composition is shit. And I try to explain to these people that, you know, we're going to build a little muscle and burn a little fat that might equal the same weight on the scale. And it doesn't fucking matter because it's going to get the goal that you want, which is to look better naked. Right. So I think that's the biggest hurdle is kind of getting, especially women to understand that the scale doesn't matter. We need to do some bigger compound movements, move some weight, build some muscle, which in turn is going to burn some fat off, get that metabolism kind of churning up and we'll mix in some of this you know, mobility, stability, corrective exercise, if you want to call it into all that and getting them to buy into that model is not always easy. Do you think you could open a gym anywhere else other than New York? Uh, Possibly. Why? (laughs) Like, I just feel like, because as I mean, New York's a tough place. Like everyone I know, like from New York is just, I mean, they swear like it's a bodily function. They, they, they're like, they're very like, this is how it's going to happen. Like, I don't want to say insensitive because like that would, buy, I group myself in with like a similar mindset, but it's like, I, I've lived in California and I listen to you talk and I go, man, if he said this in California, like it's, just, it's a gym full of snowflakes. Like it's literally a right. gym full of people that you'd, you if they don't want to do something, fuck, they'll start a Facebook group about why they don't want to do it. Like, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll write a letter to Congress about why they why want to weigh in. But it's like, do you, do you feel like because you've grown up in the same place and you're kind of a product of your environment, that that helps get buy-in? Because, like, I, I look at you and I talk to you, and I listen to you just because I'm scared. Like, I'm terrified of you. Like, <laughs> it's like he's – like, there's people who do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and I'm not a combat sports guy by any stretch of the imagination. Like, to me, like once Joe Rogan started talking about BJJ, everyone and their fucking mother started rolling around. And it's like, yeah. you're like, oh, gee, you've been doing it before it was cool. And you do the street version, eye gouging part of it. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck? And you sound like Al Pacino and you look like you should be fighting in a cage somewhere. So my buy in is like, I, I don't want to see what happens if I say no. But like, do you feel like, you know, being part of the community and like having that, that, like um, that relatability allows you to have that conversation easier. Yes. And no, I feel like where we're from here, especially on like Long Island, just outside the city, the whole community is tight knit and there's a lot of gyms. So I feel like everyone's probably very similar. I know it seems different for you, um, but I think I definitely have a harder approach with some of my clients. Like I'm big on like, 
I literally have a can't jar. And like, you know, you ever like to be, you ever grow up, like you see like people have like curse jars in the house. Like, Oh, you say a curse where you go or like at workplace and you gotta put a dollar in when people say they can't, they got to put a fucking dollar in the, in the jar because I hate the words. I can't, I'll, I won't even be like, I'll be putting weight on the bar. I'm not even done with the words coming out of my mouth and what we're going to do. And like, I can't do that. Five minutes later when they're doing that, I'm like, go put a fucking dollar in the jar. Cause you just told me you couldn't do something and you just did it like there. So it's that mindset that like, these people come in and just like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't jump onto a box. I can't, you know, lift that much weight. And it's my job to know what you can and can't do. I'm not going to push people to do something that they actually can't do, but I'm going to push people to their limits of what they can do. And that's the difference. And they're just like, I feel like part of that as a coach is the psyche is just as much as the body where you have to kind of just like train them. I feel like I've brought a lot of people mentally into a better place not just physically because they feel more confident and they could do things because I am just up their ass. Like I have a term that I think started when we got here, which was callous the mind. I'm like, Cal- I am walking around the gym yelling at people callous the mind because they're just bitching about this hurts. This is my hands hurt from lifting the bar. I'm like, not only do you need calluses on your hands, you need to callous your fucking mind and get over it and just lift the fucking bar. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's just translated into the gym and everyone knows that's how I am. And, uh, they kind of like it, I guess. Is that a generational thing, you think? Like, is that is that something – you kind of described a rough demographic of, like, the people you train. Do you feel like that's just something that's just a, a marker of the times? Oh. I mean, that weak mind – like, weak body I can understand. But a weak mind, like, I, I'm right there with you because, like, that for me is a, really as a coach, that's what you're training. It's between the ears first what's your take on that? Cause like right now I have, I'm at a loss for words with what I'm seeing with people like around our age or my age and your age, like in between. And it's like, what is the biggest contributing factor to that in your mind? <laughs> I don't know. I think other, I see other coaches that I have issues with like online, like strictly going like, listen, I am, I'm not a, like, you know, no days off guy. I am. I've actually said no days off because I think like every day we should be doing something working towards our goals. It doesn't mean we have to be going hard in the paint every day. Um, But these guys like just preach about no days off and we should just like take barefoot walks and get some sunshine like three days a week. And then maybe spin my mace bell around another day. And like, out like, like this is what they're preaching. I think like too many people I see, especially like the younger generation almost coming into the gym and going too hard into that, just like corrective exercise, like five days a week working on some mobility and corrective exercise. Like, yeah, like obviously that's a really important part, but like, I don't think I've ever seen them put weight on the bar and really get after it. And so they're missing that point. It's almost like they're going too hard the other direction and we need to kind of regulate that somewhere in the middle. I understand the guys back eighties and nineties who are just going like so hard in the ways of the no days off freaking, you know, going all out and over training, I'd say probably seven days a week. And now you have them under training seven days a week. And we need to find that, that happy medium. Who, like when you were a kid, like what movie was it? What was the actor or the sport or like the athlete? Like who was it for you? Like, was it Schwarzenegger? Was it Stallone? Was it Chuck Liddell? Was it like, who was it for you? Like, who is the guy that's like that fucking that guy? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't know if there's one person, you know, I'll give him. So I was into the rock when the rock was the rock back in WWE. You know what I mean? People's elbow rock. Yeah. Yeah. Giving it the fucking eyebrow. I I taught myself how to do the the eyebrow in the mirror. (laughs) So so I literally said, I had a mirror in my bedroom. I like was holding one eyebrow up and one eyebrow down until I could get it. So I was a big rock fan when it came to wwe i guess that was like 99 2000 um but yeah i I watched a lot of the the sly movies like rocky i think sly more than schwarzenegger for some reason um a little vin diesel maybe early 2000s but like all those guys you know kind of mixed in there well it's funny because like when i first heard you talk i was thinking adrian holy fuck like this is this but i mean that's i think of now because like we i've been dude i think i beat netflix like, I didn't know Netflix was a game. I didn't even know really what it was. I've watched TV in, like, five, six years before this lockdown. But I think we beat Netflix last night. And we just, like, got to the end of it. And they're like, look, dude, like, I don't know. Learn how to learn how to crochet something. Like, get the fuck off this thing. 
I watched this like action movie thing, and it was like some Netflixy thing. Uh, Hemsworth, a guy from yeah, Thor. I, I saw and that. I'm like, what kind of pencil neck shit is this? Like, this guy's got fucking eleven inch arms. Like, Sly is bigger than him now at seventy four years old. It's just like I don't know. I feel like it's just a systemic weakening of body and mind. Because like for me, it was the same. Like Rocky. Honestly, one of my favorites was Die Hard, because yeah. Die Hard was like John McClane, the New York City cop. Like that was I got literally do hand to God when I first went to New York. It was January, Jesus, January 2018, maybe. I went out, I had some stuff in Jersey. I was like, fuck it, like J- Jersey sucks. Jersey's, <laughs> Jersey's the tumor of New York. I'm going into <laughs> New York, and what I did by myself was I went around to like spot. I Google search where they were of like all different scenes of like where Die Hard was shot. Like that one scene where there's like the guard, the bomb in the trash can and like, they're like standing next to it, but it's like, it's a, the bomb's not actually in the trash yeah. can. And I literally like took a picture of like, send it to my dad of me, like jumping out of the way in front of the garbage can. <laughs> the garbage just, can's I, still there. Yeah. Oh, well, well like, I think it's like the, it's uh, the Gray's papaya shop is uh, there's like a few of them and it's that intersection in front of the church. And it was just like, it had the sign in the background. It's just a little thing. But it's like, for me, it's it, when we start to talk about, you know, hey, you got to go through, you got to callous your mind. And then you start to see like just differences in generation. Like, I can't tell if it's art imitating life. Like, look, Chris Hemsworth is relatively big and strong compared to what people are out there. Or people just set their standards to that. Like, if, you're, if your standards were set to WWE The Rock, like, yeah, you are going to be, like, a larger individual. Like, I used to be – like, people think he's big now. Like, they think when he does, like, you know, Fast and Furious 7, he's taking enough growth hormone that he has, like, seven sausage links behind his fucking yeah. neck. And it's like, dude, you should have seen him back then. Like, yeah, he was – you should have seen him, like, eons ago. He was big. He just wasn't as lean. But he's a monster now. I, I think he, last I saw, he was, like, 275. He's, like, 6'5", 275. He's, he's a big dude. It's and you know what, man? America's got a weird like. The hard part is you guys look just like us. Like as Canadians, like living in America, like you know, you'll you'll give Jeter shit for running crank and hitting homers, but fuck, you'll you'll got you guys hand to God as I live and breathe before I die. Dwayne the Rock Johnson will be president of the United States of America. I think so. And he, dude, he's run more fucking gas. <laughs> then Jeter, and then the major league combined. He's like Jose Canseco times Sammy Sosa, like the times Mark McGuire. Like he's, but they love it. Like he's just the dude. Yeah, I don't think you could convince half of America that that guy's on juice. I think they'll be like, no, 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 he's all natural. I'm like he's fifty and getting bigger. I'm like that's yeah. not normal. And he loves his mother. Like once you buy oh, your yeah. mom an Escalade, you could do whatever the fuck you want. The, the thing that gets me with him and like, I don't want to like turn this into like stern shit, but like it's the conditioning that he's in like the, his, his relative body composition at his age. I don't care what Polynesian Island you're from. That doesn't, Oh, uh, you, uh, you, that elliptical you're on at four thirty in the morning is not, especially when you're eating 78,000 cookies for dinner. Like that's what really gets you with him. And like, Hey man, put in the work, do the reps. But it's like that for me is the toughest thing. It's like people getting sold somewhat of like a false narrative. And like I like the idea, like he pushes like a lot of like mental toughness. But like, dude, what is going on? Like he's getting bigger and leaner yeah. as he's getting older. Doesn't it's like happen. it's crazy. No, it doesn't happen. I guess like how do you how do you program like because I mean I know in the mixed martial with the mixed martial artists I work with that the biggest thing that's gonna fail for them is their lungs. Like you talked about maybe not doing box jumps for conditioning. Like how is it that you factor in conditioning into your own training or how do you factor in conditioning in programming that is likely the rate limiter for a lot of your clients like progress. Like, look, they can't do snatches because they're too tired, right? right? They can't do box jumps because they're too tired. How do you start to scale conditioning as like a separate system that needs to be calloused, if you will? (laughs) It needs to be calloused. It does need to be calloused. First of all, I'll start off with, I hate, con- I was always the guy, once I got into lifting a lot, where like anything more than five reps is like cardio and I don't want to do it. And like, I kind of still have that mentality. So like, I'm not the type of person who's going to go out for like a mile run or a two mile run. I don't really, 
I have a lot of clients who I also like, they want to do that conditioning or they feel like they need to do something. So they go out for that run or they hit the spin bike and then their freaking knees hurt or like their hips hurt. And like, it's just like that chronic repetitive mo- movement that isn't ideal. And it's just really cardio and they're not building like that real true workload. You know what I mean? Like, so what we're going to do is, like I said, I like to use the sleds. I like to use heavy med balls or like sandbags. And I like to kind of put like mix that aerobic and anaerobic systems. I kind of have them working both at the same time instead of just like going aerobic and sweating it out because it's going to help our overall goal of body composition. Cause if we want to build some muscle going out and running five miles, isn't going to kind of help. We're kind of working in the opposite direction when it comes to that point, because now you're just running it off. So it's going to be like your body's going, wait, which way are we going? We want to build muscle. We want to just like lose as much weight as possible. Cause that muscle tissue is expensive. And if we're running all the time, your body's going to be like, let's get rid of the muscle. So, uh, heavy carry. I love heavy carries. I like doing, like I said, some sled pushes, I think it's just really the tempo behind it. I love the assault bike, but like assault bike, I mean, I, I get off the assault bike and I can't get off the floor for like five minutes when you do it right. Rowing machine, things like that, which kind of help facilitate the strength movements and you're doing some of the same movements. You're just not as dangerous. So I don't want to do squats or snatches or cleans under that fatigue, but I could do the assault bike till I fall on the ground. There's no danger behind that. And there's no skill that we're losing. So part of the problem is like people want to do like cleans until they're tired, but part of the clean is the skill of it. And if you're losing your, the skill or your skill is failing because you're tired, then you're not going to, you're losing the benefit of doing that movement where it, if you're pushing the sled to fatigue, if you're falling over, there's no skill behind that movement. So I like to take a lot of, low skill movements and push them to the fatigue instead of taking the high skill movements. I think that's like the main thing and doing that with certain tempos and certain weights, like rest periods, work periods and staggering that and progressing that. So like, you know, we're going to go 30 seconds on a minute rest and then we're going to do that for a week or two. And then we're going to go 30 seconds on 45 seconds rest. And we're going to keep progressing that movement. Maybe we're going to add some weight to those farmer sandals, add some weight to that sled and keep progressing that way. You're going to have, you're going to get your cardiovascular in there, but you're also going to get that anaerobic response as well. I think the, the two of those together of what really helped me kind of push my strength and my conditioning, because like I said, running five miles isn't in the cards. Yeah. Well, I think like you said it so simply out of the gate, and if more people got on board with just the idea that that cardio isn't conditioning, like, I think that's a really good, because I think people just, they conflate those two terms like cardio and conditioning work are the same thing. It's like, no, they're not like conditioning is an adjunct to strength training, right? If you don't have like, like you said, like a work capacity, you build your conditioning, you're going to build your work capacity. You build your cardio. You're not going to build your work capacity. Right. And like playing with the different variables. And like, I've seen this in your program, like you play to the strength of the act, like of the exercise, right? Like if it's going to be a salt bike, pushing out more Watts, might not be the strength of it. You know, hey, fucking drop the hammer on it, and we're going to take a minute rest, then 45 seconds. So increasing the density of a low-skill movement like that where res- adding resistance is, like, not really possible. You can go faster, sure, but this is going to win in a density realm or in a density space where these bouts are going to be closer and closer together. And then something like a sled, it's like, well, decreasing rest periods on a sled, it's a sled. We can put plates on it. Like this exercise wins if we put more plates on it. Right. So, but you see people all the time, like they, they miss that. They go, oh, I'm going to do conditioning. So I'm going to drag this 90 pound sled for four blocks rather than two blocks. And I'm going to go and I'm going to push for, you know, 50 cows on a rower rather than 30 cows. And it's like, why don't you just drop the hammer on the rower, go to you can't go anymore and then take a less of a rest period let that rower do what rower does or salt bike do what the assault bike does and then let the plate do what the plate loaded sled do what the plate loaded sled does right so it's like it's crazy that like that most people like majority of people when they write conditioning programs that i've seen they don't see the strengths of the implements that they're using right like farmers handles for longer distance versus heavier farmers carries it's like well we can load weight let's load weight here we can't load weight let's make more density and it's like i think we always talk about resonance and programming like 
you know, you want to create like you're a, you're a maestro and like here's, here's brass, here's uh, percussion, here's woodwind. And here's, you know, you at the top writing a program and you want all these different variables to sync up and create this resonant uh, stimulus that you can respond to or adapt to. So it's like going over cardio programs or conditioning programs. It's like seeing stuff like that written down. is like someone will look at that and be like, oh, yeah, like I'm going to go heavier on the sled this week and I'm going to cut my rest periods down on the assault bike. But it's like there's such a level of sophistication to a thought process like that. Like rather than like, cause so many people just like, you know, they throw it in a fucking hopper and what we'll pops out the <laughs> other side. Up. It's like, right. Yeah. It's like, it's like playing the fucking wheel. It's like, you're all of a sudden, what's his name and Vanna white or whatever, like just spinning it. It's like, what are you doing, man? Cause that's for me, like when you have a space like that, when the goal is, you know, concurrently training for body composition, I think we, we almost just like, we put cardio the same way we put our calves. Okay. I'll yeah. Get it home. I'll you know, get it home. I'll do it later. Doing some of this stuff, you know, it, which I knew, but it kind of helps you realize when you actually do it is it's going to help you with your performance and your strength too. training this way with the conditioning. And like, I kind of had to learn that in the past, like with this gym, I've kind of spread myself out to do a bunch of different stuff and with my members. So like in the last year, I ran like five Spartan races. And I think the first one I almost died. Like I was on the, uh, in a field rolling around with like cramps in both my hamstrings and quads at the same time, like couldn't stand up. And like, I was like, I need to do something about this. Cause like I said, I was always training for strength. So, you know, in the last year we, I did, five Spartan races, two local CrossFit competitions and a powerlifting meet. And like none of those things really kind of go together. But I found that training this type of conditioning not only helped me, just like I said, with doing something like a Spartan race or like a CrossFit competition, but I, I actually found that like on the platform, it helped me get some more weight on the bar when it came to those maximal loads. I think just because it helped me increase like my training volume being conditioned like this so people need to look at it more than just like i want to look good like if you want performance and even if that performance is putting more weight on the bar for a powerlifting or something like that like being conditioned is going to help you because if you're out of breath after three reps you know how much can you really increase your volume of training yeah and that's like the idea behind like building a work capacity and the funny thing is like i I approach a lot of this stuff and I do some things cause it's like, look, I just don't want to be able to be fucked with and not like, like a street fight. I got to gouge someone's eyes out, but no, it's not really a gouge. It's more of a scrape across the face or whatever that, whatever that takeaway was. Bear crawl, a bear, bear, bear claw. Bear claw. Yeah. That's fucking terrifying. It's, it's funny cause I think even if people just hear your accent, they're immediately afraid of you and then they actually see you and then they're even more afraid of you. But it's like, I think when it comes to, when it comes to the conditioning stuff, like building a work capacity is something that's so underutilized for strength athletes. And it's like the fact that, I mean, for me, like I said before, like I just want to be like, no one can fuck with me. Like, you know, I, I went, I went to school so no one could say I was stupid. And then I did a few jobs that frankly I fucking hated just cause I can say, look, I, I did a corporate thing. I did this other thing. I did some powerlifting stuff. Like there were times where I was like competing. I was like, look, I just picked the fucking thing up. Cause that's a big number. And like when you talk next time and you can look at someone and be like, what do you squat? All right, then shut up. Like that'll make for an easier argument. But then I think of you and it's like five OCRs, you know, CrossFit background, 12 years, you know, black belt in like, street jiu-jitsu <laughs> like and then crossfit box then powerlifting meet and it's like how much does that lead from the front mentality help like in your day-to-day -day? like because it's not only like look anyone takes one look at you goes all right this guy like clearly like he does a lot like he's people always come up to you and be like oh like what do you do like are you like are you, a, are you a fighter are you like a bodybuilder and then like they do like bicep curls because that's what bodybuilding is but like with your membership base, it's like, look, I can do it. Like you can. How helpful is that experience? Because like I'm sure off school course races are not when both your quads and hamstrings are cramping at the same time, not necessarily fun. Yeah. So it wasn't fun for me, like I said, out of the get go. But I found the at least with the obstacle course races are it's a low barrier entry, which is great for a lot of my members. So like we just ran, there was a local Spartan race in November. I put it together a team of 30 people and we all ran together. And like, 
there I am underneath like a seven foot wall, like having people step on my leg. I think I touched every ass of every person in my gym as I'm throwing them over a wall, but we got through the thing together. And I think like, those are the experiences that build like a really big, good community. Cause like we, they like to do this stuff together. And I feel like the OCRR races are good for that. And then, you know, with the CrossFit competitions, they were both, they were team competitions. So we had male and female teams going to those. And I think that myself and like Jen was running the female team. I was running the male team, you know, and then from there we didn't take other coaches. We took our members and all of our members came and watched and more people like, I want to do this. This looks like fun. And then the powerlifting meet, I actually, after uh, I did the powerlifting. I mean, I have like four or five members who like, that looked like a good time. I want to do that. So I feel like that's why I'm out there doing a lot of this stuff. Cause I want to show people like you can do this and I can help you do this. And it gives people a goal to focus on. Like when we were preparing, preparing those 30 people for that Spartan race, like everyone was dialed in for like two months, like, Oh shit, we're going to go out there and do this. Like we better get fucking in shape. So we're, you know, they were committed. And afterwards, you know, they slacked off a little bit, but then we had another one that was supposed to be coming up in April. Obviously that didn't happen, but it's a good way to keep people kind of focused and keep people like in the community. So I, I like the competitions, whichever one it is for, for that. And leading from the front with getting out there and actually doing it myself and not just being like, yeah, you guys go do this. I think is kind of the key to it. Yeah, I think that's, like, honestly, man, like, this is, you know, character doesn't matter until it's tested, right? In times like this, you kind of see people's, like, true stripes. And I think a lot of people in the fitness industry right now are, like, they're clinging to the quick fix. Like, they're clinging to, you know, they're, they're reading, like, the business book they probably wouldn't read. Or they're doing, like, you know, they're, they're kind of stepping outside of, like, their morals and values. And, like, I think they're looking the wrong places to, like, draw, like, advice or counsel or like inspiration or whatever you want to call it on like how to run a good business. Like there's one takeaway from like anything of that. It's what you just said. Like I think more people would be better off in the, in like the full picture, like more coaches and trainers and gym owners would be better off if they took the approach that you took. But by extension of that, like, you know, that's 30 people that you're throwing over walls. Like if every coach with every, with, you know, uh, 10, 15 clients and every gym owner with like a hundred or 200 members adopted that, like, I think that is something that's like an intangible that like, you're not going to read in a book. Right. But I think that's right. what a lot of people miss is like that idea. Like, like, yeah, like lead from the front. Like everyone got into this, I think to help people like that's it, when you really did boil down to it, but it's like, you know, I always make the comparison of like, you know, I was in Asia earlier this year and someone asked me for directions. I love helping people, but I couldn't help that person. Sorry, man. I don't even like, I don't know what street I'm on. I can't help you. But I feel like a lot of people don't know what street they're on. They don't know where they're going. And they let this wanting this to help people, uh, like push them to a point where they're just like willfully blind and guiding people and like it's like dude this stuff really matters like, if you fuck this up and you don't know what you're doing like you can really lead people in a bad way so i think it's like a good message for people to hear from someone like who actually like like literally in the trenches during all this man so i appreciate you taking the time and coming on um yeah. I'll, I'll do an intro and all that and, and i'll give some some background um for those i appreciate you i mean thanks for having me and all on the podcast is great. You know, I mean, I love being part of this, uh, the prescript family, the whole community with the Facebook and the, you know, I'm going to miss our meetings every week. Once this is all over with the, uh, uh the dude, level well, one, you got my phone, you got my phone number, man. No, so it doesn't have, uh, but yeah, like for those in the New York area, like where can they find you or like online, the, all that whole spiel, where can we find yeah, you? So the, the website's, uh, Ronin athletic.com. Uh, we are at Ronin athletic on Instagram for the gym. I am at the underscore Spartan underscore Samurai, if that makes sense to you now, after our conversation um, on Instagram also. And uh, that's basically, we're in Lindenhurst, New York, which is South Shore, Long Island, uh, Suffolk County. Anyone listening who knows where it is, knows where it is. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes, man. I, yeah. I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking the time, sharing that stuff with us. And uh, yeah, anyone in the New York area stopping in, make sure you... And I know how to navigate the Long Island Railway now. So would you take the Long Island Rail to get there from the city? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a stop right in Lindenhurst from Penn Station. It's about like, if you take an express train, it's under an hour. So you're right here, baby. I'm, I'm learning. Awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you, man. Take it easy.